All right, everybody, welcome back to the Millennial Sales Podcast. Your host, Tommy Tahoe. This is the show where young salespeople come to get after it in their career to get to the next level. Uh, pumped for today's episode. It's Monday, start of March, getting into it. I've got a throwback episode with you today with uh, Javon J.T. McCormick. Uh, I've done about 280-ish episodes over almost five years for this podcast, and this is hands down one of the three to five best, definitely the most inspirational podcast that I've ever done, and it was a few years ago. Um, let me tell you a little bit about JT. Uh, he goes by, his full name is Javon, uh, nicknamed JT. Um, here's just a quick, a quick rap sheet. So his mother was an orphan. His father was a pimp and a drug dealer. And he was deserted by his parents, deserted by his mother. And when he was only eight years old, he was living with JT's, with his father's prostitutes because he was a pimp. He was only eight years old. He was living with them. He was taking care of his step siblings. Um, he somehow uh, managed to, you know, make it through, get into high school. Uh, he graduated late, so he actually got his diploma from the janitor during summer school. Later, he was homeless and he was living on a park bench. Okay. Nowadays, he is the president and CEO of Scribe Media, uh, which is, helps to. Um, you know, co-author books. So you've probably heard of David Goggins, who is the endurance athlete uh, and, you know, one of the most famous, intense people on the planet. He helped, they helped to write his book uh, and thousands of others. He's business partners with Tucker Max, who's well-known uh, best-selling author as well. Um, and to get between, you know, being homeless and where he is as a CEO, how did JT do it? Well, he got into sales. Um, he got into uh, technology sales and went step-by-step and uh, within this first few years of, of working at a tech company, he went from homeless to entry-level employee to president of the company. <laughs> and I don't even know how he did that, um, but he gets into it a little bit uh, on this podcast. He talks about uh, the grind that he has, you know, wakes up at 345 in the morning. He, he reads about entrepreneurs and business people. Uh, that are either minorities or women because they have tougher roads that he wants to learn from them. Um, he talks about uh, the, his leadership skills. So he talks about the tribe that he has. He doesn't call it a team. He doesn't call it a company. He calls it a tribe. And they have a very uh, well-regarded uh, public Google Doc that I can put in the notes here that is, you know, talks about kind of like the, the rules of the tribe that, that they have, and it's gone viral. And a lot of his posts have gone viral on LinkedIn. So if you want to uh, learn about leadership. If you want to get fired up, if you want to, you know, get a little kick in the ass to start your Monday morning, then you are in the right place. Uh, JT, as one of the things that he says in this pod, he says, I don't wish, I don't hope, I don't get lucky. I believe in myself and execute. So whew, we, let's, let's get into that real quick uh, before we get into the podcast uh, for 27 seconds. Let me talk to you about um, how you can help this show. So please subscribe wherever you're listening on Spotify, YouTube, Apple, leave a review if you're on Apple. And then please do follow me on LinkedIn. My name is Tom Alamo. I post just about every single day about sales and growth mindset. So I'd love your support there. There's a lot of great things coming in the works for the rest of this year. So show some love if you can. Now, without further ado, here is my throwback interview with Javon McCormick. Let's go. On this episode of TR Talk. I've been everything from sexually molested by my dad's prostitutes to in and out of juvenile three different times. I grew up on welfare. I've been homeless on a bus stop. So, you know, and then from there, I don't have a college degree. I did not graduate high school. I had to go to summer school to, to get my high school diploma. And I've been a president of a software company and now I'm the president and CEO of a publishing company. So there's the short version. All right. Welcome back to TR Talk Podcast, where we help millennials fast track their personal development. In this episode, we are coming to you with number one of 2018 with our good friend, JT McCormick, 
Now, JT has an incredible, a truly incredible story where he went from the low of the low. He was homeless. He has no high school education. His father was a pimp and a drug dealer. And now he is the CEO of Book in a Box, which is the company founded by Tucker Max. An incredible story we're excited, we're excited to share with you about JT. Real quick, we want to introduce our TR Talk Fan of the Week, Mary Regan. Thank you so much, Mary, for listening, for leaving the five-star review. Congrats on your recent wedding. Uh, so happy for you, and thanks again for the support. If you'd like to support the TR Talk podcast, you can do so by heading to iTunes, leaving a five-star review like Mary did, subscribing, and sharing out on social media. Now we're going to take you back to the airwaves to get your resolution straight for 2018 with JT McCormick. JT, welcome to the show. Thank you, gentlemen. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. We appreciate you, and and we're fired up for this one. Uh, And JT, you have one of the craziest backstories that we have ever come across, Um, and you wrote about it in your book this year called I Got There. And we'd love to start there for to have you talk about really just what your journey's been like. Wow, man, that's an open question. So, <laughs> so truth be told, that that book was written 100% for my children. I, I never intended for that book to go public. I, I've got no legacy. My father was a, a black pimp and drug dealer in the 1970s. My mother is is a white woman. She was an uh, orphan and she was raised in an orphanage back in the 1950s, an institutional uh, orphanage. So I, I'm half white, half black in the 70s. Uh, <laughs> back then, that was not a cool thing to, to be. Black people didn't like you because you were half white. White people didn't like you because you were half black. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I... I'll give you the short version. I've been everything from sexually molested by my dad's prostitutes to in and out of juvenile three different times. I grew up on welfare. I've been homeless on a bus stop. So, you know, and then from there, I I don't have a college degree. I did not graduate high school. I had to go to summer school to, to get my high school diploma. And I've been a president of a software company. And now I'm the president and CEO of a publishing company. So there's the short version. Now, we appreciate that, JT, but you know we're going to peel the onion back a little bit here. We got to go back. We got to go way back. Um, so, so you know, we, you know, at age 10, essentially, right, your, your mother, you're, you start to live with your father, right? And then, um, and then from you know, 10 to 13, you're with your father, and then age 13 on, you're with your Uncle Bobby, which we'll get into in a second, but... Um, did I get the Did I get the order right there yeah. in terms of yeah. how everything went down? Yeah, right uh, from from so I'd say from about the ages of nine to uh, thirteen, I was with with uh, well, I was supposed to be with my dad. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And, and what was that? Like? Do you have memories of that? What was that like? Just oh. you know, living with um, living with prostitutes essentially or your dad's gone in london a lot like what was that like yeah, so so my dad uh you know i was living with one of my dad's prostitutes and he had three children with her so my my half brothers and sisters and my dad said one day he was going to england for two weeks and he ended up being gone for about a year and i'll, I'll give you one quick story so the, this prostitute one day she says hey, I'm going to go up to the store and get a pack of cigarettes. And and I can still remember this. It was Sunday afternoon, and I didn't think twice of it. And so she leaves, and truth be told, she was a horrific heroin addict as well. So she leaves me with my four, two, and uh, four, three, and two-year-old half-brothers and sisters. So she leaves Sunday afternoon. Uh, Sunday evening comes around. She's not back. One day turns into three, three turns into five. We're running out of food. We don't have any food. She hasn't come back. So I run down to the store, leave my oldest sister with the the younger ones. I steal some food for us to to eat. And I come back, five days turns into seven. Well, we've run out of diapers at this point. So I've got my little uh, uh, brother and I got to potty, potty train him. He's two years old. I sit him on the toilet and he's crying and he's yelling and I'm crying because I don't know what to do. And so it just, it, it was a horrific environment. And long story short, she was gone for three weeks and I was supposed to be in school this whole time. 
And when she comes back, you know, my, my half brothers and sisters, she is, they're, they're elated to, to see her. They're happy. Their mother's back. Well, I'm kind of pissed off. So I look at her and I say, where the F have you been? And this woman punched me so hard in the side of the head, my ears started bleeding. I fell and she, you know, just started kicking and punching me. And so from there, I, I went from that prostitute to a different prostitute's house. And I ended up in, in juvenile or beating up another prostitute because I got tired of being beat myself. So, yeah, just it was a, a horrific childhood, if you will. Holy shit, excuse my French, but, and you were, what, 10 at the time of all this, I 10, around yeah. that age? I, I, that, that, that particular story, I was 12. Wow, that's insane. Um, it's really, uh, truthfully, it's it's hard to, to fathom that that, that happened. Um, and so, on the flip side, it sounded like... Um, once you hit the age of 13 or, or maybe 14, that your uncle Bobby uh, helped you to kind of change the path that you were on um, and and kind of f- reverse that a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, I, I was I was in juvenile and <laughs> what ended up happening. So so I go by JT, but the, the J actually stands for Javon. So back in the 70s, early 80s, that wasn't a popular name. It's a little more popular now. And so I was, and I had been in there two and a half months. No one had come to see me. No one had called. No one, truth be told, no one knew I was in there. And my father was in England. My mother was in Texas. No one knew I was in juvenile. So that was one of those moments where I I said to myself, thank God my mother named me Javon. One of the correctional officers said, hey, is your name Javon? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, do you have an Aunt Jean? And I said, yes. So she calls my aunt and says, hey, I, I believe we have your nephew here. And no one's come to see him. No one knows he's here. He's just been here. And so my aunt came and picked me up. She took me to my Uncle Bobby's house. My Uncle Bobby took me in. And from there, I learned manners. I learned, yes, ma'am. Thank you. May I please? No, sir. Uh, He taught me structure. He taught me discipline. I mean, we went to church on Sunday, books, uh, Bible study on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And really, if he said to do something, you did it. And he was just a a, a man of structure, discipline, routine, and you were going to follow the rules. And that for me, that was the first time I had ever had that type of structure. Yeah, it seems like a man of no nonsense. And, and this is all taking place where in the Midwest or where, where is this all happening at? Dayton, Ohio. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's a small story. We used to race boats in Dayton, Ohio all the time on the lake there in the city. So I've been there many times, actually. Yeah, don't don't admit that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. Well, and then so, okay, so then you, we're just going to kind of go in chronological order. We don't always do that, but I think here it's fitting to do so. So, um, so then you... You go back to Texas, right? And then you, you know, do you move back in with your mother? And you, you go to like, you go to high school, but then you, you know, I think the a janitor gave you your diploma. Like, could you just keep 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 us going, baby? Keep us going here. <laughs> yes. So so I get back with my mother, and I I'm a sophomore now. When I, I get back with my mother, and we enroll in in high school, and so I had been pushed through, you know, a, a school system in, in Dayton. I just been pushed through. So we're, we're registering and the teacher says, OK, so you're in 10th grade. You should be in geometry. Why well, didn't say anything? Truth be told, that was the first time I'd ever even heard the damn word geometry. I didn't know what it was. And so they put me in this class and I'm completely lost. And so everyone realizes very fast that um, academically, I'm not the smartest of people. So they test me and I test everything at, at about a fifth or sixth grade level. Well, what that turned into was by the time my senior year rolled around, I could not graduate. And so I didn't get to walk the stage. I had to go to summer school to take some remedial classes to to get my high school diploma. So I finish up at summer school. They give you this piece of paper and they say, okay, go back to your school and you can get your high school diploma. So I'm pumped. I'm like, oh, yes, this, this is awesome. Confetti's about to fall from the sky. Fireworks are going to go off. And so I go in 
And there's the janitor and this lady sitting at a desk. And I said, yes, I'm here to pick up my high school diploma. Janitor takes the piece of paper. The lady looks at it. She says, yes. Janitor unlocks the, the safe, comes over, hands me my high school diploma and walks away. And so I'm looking around like, OK, that's it. Where, where's my confetti? Where's where's the party? Where's the fireworks? And so I walk off nothing. And I go, wow, this is this is it, huh? And I go to the parking lot. And to make matters worse, I get home. I tell my mother, I go, hey, we got, got my high school diploma. And she goes, great. You got two weeks to find a job. And I'm going, damn, can I get some confetti from someone? <laughs> <laughs> Give the man some confetti, all right. Today, I'm 46. Um, I'm still waiting for confetti. <laughs> it's in the mail, JT. It's in the mail. <laughs> um, now, it obviously... Looking back now, you know that this is a a crazy story, right? It's not a typical upbringing. At the time, did you realize that hey, like I have not had a normal life, or like was it just you know, all you I, knew? I, I say this to everyone: you don't know what you don't know. So when I was poor, and my mother and I were were hungry, and and you know, my mother only had two dollars to get us through the whole week, or the, the end of the month. Sometimes we'll come around and we wouldn't have money. When you're when you're poor and it's all you know, that's all you know. So you don't understand that there's another side to life. You don't know rich, wealth, money, abundance of food. We the best way I, I explain it to people is we did not live, we survived. And so no, I, I didn't know that there was another side. Really, it wasn't until I got with my uncle Bobby that I started to realize there was another side to, to life. Um I didn't even know you can order a pizza until I was 15 years old. I had never had a chicken breast until I was about 17. So I it just, there were things that I just did not know. So confetti's on the way. Chicken breast is on the way. We, we got you covered, JT. <laughs> we got you covered here. Um, it, it, now I think, yeah, that the, the phrase crisis creates opportunity is certainly fitting here. So, you know, I think, how did you make the jump from your, uh, your this crazy background, this crazy upbringing to the mortgage industry where you, it sounds like you made a, a good piece of money and then, and then what was it, 2008 happened and that's how you kind of started from the bottom again? I'm just trying to piece things together here. Oh, man. So, so yes, got introduced to the, the mortgage industry, did well, made some, some great money. And, and I have to say, too, uh, a, a lot of people look at him as the villain but as, as I've, uh, I guess, grown in my career, I had the incredible opportunity meeting Angelo Mazzello, who was the founder of Countrywide, which just so happened, that's where I had worked and done, done well for myself. But yeah, I, I had made a ton of money. And with most people who don't come from money, I won't say most, a lot, who come from money and have never had money, once you get it, you don't know what to do and you don't know how to. So I lost every dollar that I made. I, I literally went negative. My stepfather had to loan me money. My best friend had to pay my rent. And so I was broke and, and had to dig myself out of, out of that hole. And, you know, it just, it, it was a valuable lesson because I can tell you this, I'll never be broke again. Yeah, that's, that's, if, if the story ended there, it would still be, an incredible uh, path, but but it but it didn't obviously, and and you're not still there. So you've been able to work yourself back up again. And my understanding is that, um, you know, you went over to a company called Headspring uh, around 2011. You were the lowest paid employee, and within two years, you were the president of the company. <laughs> so I, how did that happen? That is really all I can ask. You know it's I, I appreciate that. And, and let me say this first. One, I was surrounded by incredibly smart uh, software engineers. So that that really helped. But I was the lowest paid sales guy. And we used to make our sales calls uh, uh, on fold out metal chairs in a storage closet. And so when I started there, I was employee number 13. And we were 13 people, lowest paid, and we just grew from there. I learned how to sell uh, software, had never sold software before. So I taught myself, as I've done with everything, okay, how do I sell software? And, and what am I 
how am I going to do this? And so we grew the company mm-hmm. from 13 people to well over 100 people. We ended up with offices in Austin, Houston, Dallas, and Monterey, Mexico. And you know, it, it was a phenomenal opportunity, and I, I made the most of it. But to to your point, everyone celebrates or wants to know, "Wow, JT, how did you go from lowest paid person to to president?" And it's celebrated, but no one wants to talk about the details. So I'm going to throw the details out to you. Um, 18 hour days, a, an immense hustle and grind. Um, I, I'll I'll share this with you. In the five years I was with that company, I took 11 days vacation. You know, we live in a society where people take 11 days vacation in in the first quarter of the year. I took 11 days Mm -hmm. vacation in five years. And there there is a picture of me uh, with my firstborn. There's a picture of me in the delivery room. And if you look behind me, my laptop is is open. I'm in the delivery room with my wife, firstborn uh, coming and there's a picture of my laptop open. So I always tell people, sacrifice. That's that's how I, I did it. You There's three things, sleep, sacrifice, and success. You, you, there, whatever greatness you aspire for, there's going to be some sacrifice. And so many people, it's, it's comical to me, we celebrate, celebrate the term binge watching. Oh, what'd you do this weekend? I watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> Episode one through thirty-eight. We didn't leave the house, and, and I, I laugh. And I'm going, wow. In many ways, society has just made it easy for someone to succeed. While somebody else is binge watching, I'm going to go study my crap. I'm going to learn leadership, scale, and I'll just outwork everybody. And so that that's how I did it. That's a story these days, JT. Talking about a, a show you watch. That's a. That's a story on Monday morning, which is crazy. <laughs> Just insane. The the model, I love the company. I love the culture of Netflix. But just last night, I was looking on there and, and I saw it. they have a, a category now. It says binge watch worthy. And I thought, oh, my God, are you kidding me? And so it's it's mind blowing that we celebrate this and and. Help me out here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on my soapbox and probably going to piss some people off on this one. The other, thing, the other thing that's comical to me is we as a society will celebrate and, and bring news cameras to an Apple store for people who will stand in line 36 hours to get the new iPhone that does two new things that your old shit did. I, I'm... I'm blown away by that. And then we watch this individual come out of the store, hands in the air, celebrating. But I'll ask people this. When is the last time anybody studied 36 hours straight their 401k, their investment strategy, their retirement planning? You are going to find very few that can sit there and say they have. Uh, I mean, it's it's just the truth right there. That's just the truth. Um, And not many can say they have uh, I would agree with that and this is coming from a guy that I think I have the iPhone 4 it's I barely even we were just trying to get it to work before this um it took me about 5 hours to figure out how to charge it cuz it's it's pretty busted up so it's pretty funny yeah so i just want to go back to one thing because yeah you talk about that crazy work ethic right and i think we can all agree that's that's not the norm. And in fact, you now I don't think you even encourage that kind of uh, culture. So, how, I mean, it certainly worked for you, but it's not worked for everybody. I mean, would you say that you don't encourage that kind of culture? You want a little bit more balance now? Because I read an article where I think one of your guys went on vacation and you tried to take his phone away when he was on vacation so he couldn't work. So how does that how does that uh, play itself out now? You know, so we, we don't have a quote unquote vacation policy. You know, we're a result driven organization. Everyone's an adult, drive results, you know, take care of your responsibilities. But at the same time, it's it's a culture of realizing that, hey, one, one of our tribe members, we don't call them employees, one of our tribe members needs some time off. They, they're going on, on vacation with their family and that, that stress is not needed. So, you know, it's, it's that fine balance of making sure you, you, you we're taking care of our tribe members. And, and I, I, the other term that you won't hear me use as well is work-life balance. 
if if you if someone has to say thank God it's Friday because they want to trade two days for five, don't 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 work with us. That we're, we're the wrong organization for for you because that is just a bad mindset. If you are in an an opportunity, a career, a job, whatever, that you have to be excited to have two days off versus the five that you put in, you got to find a different career. So I, I'm a I'm a whole self type person, and we're a whole self type tribe. Where love what you do, and thank God it's Saturday. I, you know, I don't know the difference if it's Saturday or Tuesday. If it wasn't for my children, I wouldn't know it was the weekend. Yeah, and that's that's really powerful, and, and it was something that um, one of our first episodes we had Andy Matthews, who's a VP of Sales, and she was saying, you know, if you're saying thank God it's Friday, you're in the wrong gig, right? And I, we couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I want to dig a little bit closer on that, um, you know, tribe member versus employee. You seem like someone that um, the way you structure things are not by accident. It's very meaningful. So can you dive into why you refer to them as, as a tribe member versus an employee? You know, there's a few pieces here and, and, and bear with me. There's, you know, you, you hear now it's really popular servant leadership, servant leadership. And if you go to our website, and, and you look, I'm at the bottom of our website. In my opinion, if you are going to be the leader, you are there to serve the organization. So in my opinion, I should be at the bottom of the website because technically I don't do the work. Our, our tribe members, our organization, they're doing the work. So see those folks. If you're coming to the website to find me, I want to make damn sure you see all of the individuals who are actually doing the work long before you get to the bottom and you and you find me. I, I, I express this to our tribe all the time. Just because you give someone three letters, CEO, that does not make you a leader. That's a role. I already had two initials in JT. Giving me three more didn't really mean anything. And so for me, people don't work for me. People work with me. And I and I express that to people all the time. Oh, JT, it's a pleasure to work for you. No, you work with me. We're in this together. There's no working for me. So saying tribe members, we don't refer to them as employees because employees are just easily let go, laid off, fired. We have tribe members because we care about you both at work and what you going on in your personal life. And, and you heard me say this, it's a whole self culture where just because the quote unquote workday ended, we don't stop caring about you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so one thing that is really sticking out to me is, is, you know, clearly through your journey, you've grown a lot, but it's not from formal education. So I know we talked about, you know, your uncle Bobby, but along the way, you know, what has the process of uh, mentorship been like, or are you learning through others' actions, or from books, or how has that you know gone through your career? And then how does how do you, how are you learning today these new skills? Everything is th- for me mass consumption of of learning. The the internet has been the greatest. I, I, I can tell you, for me, I have benefited greatly from the the invent uh, of the internet. Anything and everything you want to learn is there. So I study leadership. My, my day consists of every morning I get up between 3.45 a.m. and 4 a.m. And people will ask, oh, my God, how, how do you get up so early? I'm not a morning person. Well, you're right, because you just said you're not a morning person. So, But for me... Hold up, hold up, hold up, <laughs> hold up, JT. Hold up, JT. I love what you just said there. It's like what you tell yourself... Is the truth, right? So if you say you're not a morning person or if you say you're not good at sales, you're not. Yeah. But if you tell yourself you are, that's the beginning of change, right? Totally. totally. If you say, oh, my God, I'm not a morning person. Well, yeah, you're, you're right. You're, you're not because you just said said you're not. And and let, I want to be clear as well. People will say all the time, damn, how do you get up at 4 a.m.? I'm human. Don't get me wrong. There are days where that alarm clock goes off and, and I don't want to get out of bed. But here's the mindset. Here's the choice. I think to myself, wow, there's someone in a hospital bed somewhere right now with cancer who's never going to leave that hospital bed. And all I get to do is get out of bed, 
go hustle and grind, make the most of my day. I, I, I live in a beautiful home, beautiful family. Everyone's healthy. I get to, I'm allowed to get out of bed and go make the most of my day. And that's how I, I jump out of bed because I realized someone would be happy just to get out of bed and walk to the restroom and they'll never be able to do that. And all I have, all I get to do, get to do, that's very critical. I get to get up and make the most of my day. That's, <laughs> it's really funny that you say that because um, Ryan and I actually just ran a marathon uh, a couple, a couple weeks ago and, you know, we would get up and, and we're, we're early risers ourselves, usually between, you know, four and five. And one thing that when we didn't want to train is like, no, you don't have to run or you don't have to work or have to do this podcast. We get to, we're very fortunate. And, um, that thought of gratitude and perspective, I think has been, uh, something that, Every single person that we talk to has pointed to that that's a major key for their success. Totally. Totally. Life, life is full of choices. You get to choose exactly what you want to do. And, and guess what? Some of those choices are hard. They're going to take effort. They're going to take sacrifice. And, and that's a word so many people run from is sacrifice. You just have to figure out what area of your life you're going to make sacrifices in. In, in, in our household, I actually... Our direct TV subscription. I love college football. I love the NFL. But I took off of our subscription. I took off ESPN because I don't want to put any of my focus on sports. I want to focus on my family. I want to focus on growing the business. I want to focus on investments, learning leadership. Um, so it's it's just comes down to what are the choices you make in life. And it, and it compounds over time, certainly. Now, let's get back to your daily routine. Where for some reason we love learning about daily routines. We're weird like that, JT. But uh, so you, you get up at your three forty-five four. Talk us through your step by step. What happens yeah, then? Three forty-five four. I I go and I sit for a, a bit, fifteen twenty minutes. And you know, some people say meditation. I pray. And then from there, I study my craft. I study leadership. I study women CEOs. I, I find them to be the most fascinating because there's so few of them. And in many ways, their journey has been harder to get to the top. And they've had to operate in many ways uh, through perfection in their decisions and what they say. So I love to study women CEOs and women in leadership. And so I study my craft for about an hour, hour and a half if I'm on a roll. Then I head to the gym for an hour, hour and a half. I come home, I help my wife get the, the children ready and eat. We've got a eight month old, a two and a half year old and a four year old. So it's chaos totally in the house. Uh, we get them ready. They get off. I head to the office. Uh, I get to work with our incredible tribe. Do that. Grind it out to about five, five thirty. Head home. Get home at six. We eat dinner, hang out, read books. I've started this new thing now. I shut my laptop off and I shut my phone off from the hours of six to eight so I can be 100% present with, with my children and my family. And I'm getting better at that. It's been, been a hard thing, but again, it's a choice. So spend time with the family from six to eight, put the kids in bed. We do bath, blah, blah, blah. Sit down with my wife for a little bit. I may get a little more hustle grind in for uh, you know 30 minutes and I'm, I'm back in bed at about 10, 10 p.m. And that's a that's a day's work. That's a that's a ton you're getting done. I want to go back to uh, just two things though. Uh, first thing is, you said you you learn your craft. How do you learn? Are you reading blog articles? Are you reading books? Are you like how can like walk us through that hour of learning um, to hone your skill? What does that what does that look like? Like what you do uh, today or so, yesterday? So what what did I do? I've I've read about yeah a lot of reading, a lot of blog posts, uh, magazines. HBR. I, I listen to, to Audible and I listen to it at one and a half so so I can squeeze more in. You know, for, for me, I'm a very slow reader. So Audible has been just phenomenal for me. If I hear it, I retain it. There's sometimes when I'm reading, especially a book. And if it's a longer book, man, I catch myself reading pages three and four times trying to uh, retain what, what I just read. But if you give me a nice article or a blog post, I can retain that faster. So yeah, it, it's anything and everything I can get my hand on. I love a good 
a documentary uh, about you know a, a business, why it succeeded, why it hasn't. Truth be told, I've learned far more from businesses that have made bad decisions than I've ever learned from someone's successes. What I mean by that is success, in my opinion, is pretty easy. You just R and D it, rip off and duplicate. And so, and but failure is where I've learned so much. Why did J.C. Penney make the decisions they've made? Why did uh, Blockbuster not pay the fifty million to buy Netflix? So I love studying, and, and so you it, bear with me. Here's one that I really. Why the hell did it take McDonald's so damn long to start serving breakfast all day? You know, this, so I love <laughs> Man, that, was it 10.30 back in the I day? Mean, it stopped at 10.30? New CEO comes in, uh, Easter book. He comes in. He says, okay, we're going to serve breakfast all day. And damn, he's a genius now. And the stock goes from $92 to 126 off of that decision. I'm going, come on. That was so third grade decision making. And, but. People went crazy for that. I remember. <laughs> so, so I, I just love studying uh, the decisions of CEOs, businesses. Uh, truth be told, uh, offend a lot of people here. I even love studying the dumbass decisions boards make. You know, I, I tell people all the time, CEOs do not set their compensation. The board does. So in many ways, when we're angry at this CEO and they're being paid too much, well, be mad at the board because they're the one that set the pay. Yep, exactly. Have you seen the documentary Smartest Guys in the Room about Enron? Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I knew you're a Texas guy, so I figured you did. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a crazy one, right? Um, so I know we're we're getting near the bottom of the hour, and JT, we could we could go back and forth with you all day. We want to get into a few questions from the audience, um, and then we're going to book our flights to Austin to come hang out with you, man, because 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 this is this is a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, Time you guys want to come down, come on down. Uh, we'll take you up on that. We are considering, uh, I know we talked about it before the show, we are considering South by Southwest. So, um, and, and likewise, if you're in San Francisco, you know, just let us know um, and we'd be happy to, to meet up. So let's, uh, let's give some love to the audience here a little bit. Um, so first things first for me is, um, of my, I have a list here on my, uh, on my notebook. And, you know, it's, you know, I, how did you how did you choose sales as a career for you um, back when you you're in high school you know you could do whatever you wanted um, how did you choose sales and like why did you stay with it you, you know I I'm a person who always looks to take a positive from from a negative even the very worst situations I, I look to find the the positive and so I'll go back on those rare occasions those solar eclipses where my father did pick me up when I was a kid, I always watched how he interacted. Everyone loved him. Everyone would talk to him. We couldn't drive 10 minutes in his car without somebody wanting to stop and talk to him. And regardless if people uh, think this is a disgusting way that I learned, it was the environment that I came from. So I made the most of my learning opportunities. And watching my father, it takes a special type of person to be able to convince a woman to go stand on the corner, sell herself and bring all the money back to you. And so I watched <laughs> how my father operated and I watched the things that he said and, and the things that he did. And I just transferred those, what I call hood lessons into corporate America. And, and there's so many, I, follow me here for a second. There's so many of them. And when I, I mentor youth now, I tell them dress code is the same in corporate America as it is in the hood. There's certain hoods you don't go, you don't wear blue or red in. Well, guess what? There's certain boardrooms that you don't wear sweatpants in. You have to wear a suit. So dress code is the same in the hood as it is in corporate America. You know, we call it business casual. Well, okay, maybe it's a it's a, a throwback jersey in, in the hood, but dress code is everywhere. So mm -hmm. sales for me came pretty easy, just watching how how my father operated. Well, it's funny you say that because you know, I think of my my own path in sales the same way. I, you know, I call it street smarts, right? My mom was a nurse. Um, 
you know, educated, hard worker. But then on my dad's side of the family, you know, there was a lot of chaos. My older brother uh, in and out of jail several times. Um, you know, when I was 14, I actually went on a uh, we went on a, a road trip together just uh, across the I grew up in the, by the Mississippi River. Next thing you know, we're outside of a crack house and he leaves me in the car when he I didn't know this at the time. But he leaves me in the car comes out with people chasing him. He Well, he robbed the crack dealers and then they took a baseball bat to the windshield. And so like, this is the environment I grew up in. But to your point, when he wasn't on one of those, uh, on one of those, you know, benders, I guess you wouldn't even know that he was uh, a drug addict, right? He was like one of the coolest, you know, just uh, street smart people ever. So I think there's a lot of parallels there when you were telling that story uh, from some of my own experiences. I love that you said that. I, I tell people all the time, I grew up in absolute chaos Chaos has come relatively easy because the chaos that I come from, man, business and the levers that move business, it's it's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's crazy. That's a crazy story. I don't think I knew that one about about Ryan. Um <laughs> so another question from the audience here is is nowadays you are president and CEO of Book in a Box, uh, which was founded from by Tucker Max, who a lot of folks know from his several books and his blog. Uh, so the question is, you know, what's it like to have been working with Tucker? <laughs> that is the number one question that that I get from people now. What's it like <laughs> to be the the, the CEO of, of the company that Tucker Max founded, and and here's the thing: everyone wants to hear this answer. Oh man, I come into the office and Tucker's passed out on the conference. <laughs> everywhere and there's three or four women who are passed out naked on the <laughs> that's the answer everybody wants to hear but here's the truth tucker one doesn't drink beer anymore he's a complete wine snob he doesn't even drink wine it's probably less than a 150 dollars a bottle he's married two kids two dogs lives in a gated community and he's in bed by 9 a.m. or 9 p.m., sorry. So that's Tucker Max. And and I actually have a picture of Tucker Max playing Pretty Pretty Princess with my daughter. <laughs> Come on, Tucker. Can we, Come on, man. Can we get that picture and put it in the show notes or what? <laughs> What's crazy? You're talking the person who I hope they serve beer in hell, assholes finish first. Well, guess what? Fathers go to bed at 9 p.m. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> man that's man. his next book i appreciate the honesty jt but to your point i'm a little disappointed right now <laughs> a little disappointed <laughs> you are and, and, and i will say this as well um on a serious note you know tucker is by far and and i don't say this because i i don't have to we've already fired him once from ceo so it's it's not like i need to to protect my role um by far one of the smartest people that i've actually ever met He's he's one of those borderline genius people where he's a little uh, socially oblivious to the the world because he's so smart. He just sees sees things a little bit different. And that's another piece that many people don't get to experience about Tucker. So let's dig in there, I think, because if anything that the audience wants to hear is like, you know, what is this guy like? Um, You know, there's such a you've. You rarely talk about people where there's such a polarizing opinion on someone as there is for Tucker Mack. So, um, you know, he essentially went to law school when he was living in the Caribbean. I mean, barely going to class. That's how smart the guy is. Um, And then he writes this book. So what do you think it is about him that enabled him to have the success he has? Is it the writing? Is it the smarts? Is it just the way he handles people? Like, what what is it for him? I I have found with, with most people that it's never just one thing. It, it you know, Tucker's past, he Tucker grew up in a bit of, of chaos as well. Fortunately for him, he had, uh, you know, a, a few dollars with it. His, his dad's a, a very popular restaurateur. So Tucker came, you know, had, had a little bit of, of money behind him. And that, that definitely helps in the chaos. But he is an incredibly smart person. I don't believe it's ever one thing. He, he is smart. Um, and Tucker is one who will try to crack the code on things. He doesn't conform to society whatsoever. Uh, truth be told, Tucker wears shorts. He wears Lululemon every day. So shorts and T-shirts every 
day. And we're, we're polar opposite when it comes to that. I wear tailored suits, tailored shirts, and Tucker wears nothing but shorts and, and t-shirts. So he is definitely his own person and he won't conform for anyone. And those are some of the pieces that, that have led to his success. Yeah, just kind of breaking down the barriers and, and breaking down rules. I, I mean, that that's something that seems pretty apparent about Tucker. Um, so, JT, look, this has been awesome. Um, we've, we had a great time chatting it up with you. Uh, last question here, or two questions here for, for us is, you know, first, where can we find you, um, you know, on social media or talk about the book here for a second? Um, and the second thing would just be any last final words here for the audience. Wow, where can where can you find me? Uh, there's the the real JT McCormick uh, on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn, JT McCormick. Uh, you can email me JT at bookinabox.com. Uh, the book is easy to find. It's on it's on Amazon. Uh, I got here, uh, but the the last words that that I would say to to individuals is life truly is mindset and, and choices. And I'm going to sound like an old school, bad 2 a.m. infomercial here. But if anyone can come from the background that I come from, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that success is, is out there to be had by anybody who wants it. If you want something bad enough, you will make it happen. Why I've been successful in, in sales is when someone would say no to me, no just meant not right now. And my mindset has always been, okay, when I was a kid and I came home, bear, bear with me here, and I would hope there was food to eat, it never produced anything. So I eliminated the word hope out of my vocabulary. When I was at home and I wished we had food, it never produced anything. So I've eliminated wish out of my vocabulary. When people talk about the lady who won the $700 million Powerball, and people say, oh my God, she was so lucky. No, she wasn't. She bought a ticket. She wasn't lucky. And so I don't do luck. I don't do wish. I don't do hope. I do belief and I do execution. You want anything in life, execute on it and go get that shit. Go get it, baby. And JT, what what a great way to wrap this thing up. You know, it's been a long week for me with the conference. I'm a little tired, but I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to hit the streets. Let, let's get selling, people. Let's get back on it. So, JT, have a have a great day at Book in the Box. Um, and yeah, man, just thank you again. We're going to get this out soon. So, uh, listeners, we have another episode coming up next week. And we got like six in the hopper, people. So, it's going to be a great uh, great uh, rest of November and rest of December. So, again, JT, thank hey you guys, so much, sir. I appreciate it. I'm incredibly humbled and honored that you would even have me on the show. So, so thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. Hey, it's, like, it's mutual, man. I really appreciate it. Take care, guys. Woo! That was awesome. Thank you guys for listening. We do appreciate it. If you want to help support the podcast, there's three things you can do. You can leave us a review on iTunes, subscribe, or push us out to the interwebs. We'll be back next week with ultra marathon runner and New York Times bestselling author, Rich Roll. Thank you again, folks. Good night. Thanks for checking out that episode. Start of the year. Let's kick some ass again. One of my goals for this show is to get as many subscribers uh, wherever you're listening here uh, on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, et cetera. Subscribe, leave a review, and then hit me up on uh, LinkedIn, Tom Alemo, uh, or any of my other socials at Tommy Tahoe. Look forward to connecting with you there. Peace.